What's good? How y'all doing? What's good? good? What's good? All right, all right. What if I told you that the way that you use language every day had the power to either uphold or disrupt social injustices? What if I told you that because language is saturated with history and culture and memory, the way that it is policed within our classrooms and our communities is deeply connected to racism and colonialism. You see, when I was 19 years old, I sat on a panel for a room full of high school students. And a woman in the room stopped me in the middle of speaking, and she said, I, I'm sorry to stop you, but I just want you to know that, that you are so articulate. And in that moment, she meant it as a compliment. A friend of mine next to me was like, boo! And I was offended. And most people can understand that. Most people say, well, you were offended because you're a young black woman in this space and this woman found it exceptional that you were mastering standard English. But there's another reason why I was offended. I imagined if this woman heard me speaking with my family who's Trinidadian in Caribbean creolized English, would she have determined something else about my intellectual capacity? Or if she heard me speaking with my friends in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, in African-American English, would she have determined something different about my worth? And in that moment, I understood that the answer was yes. And that deeply disturbed me. It actually became the impetus for my first TED Talk, Three Ways to Speak English. It actually became the impetus for my research as a social scientist, analyzing the intersections of language, race, and power. You see, I'll share this story, and you gotta work with me, because it's about a man and a lion, and they're talking, all right, work with me. So, the man and the lion are walking through the jungle together, and, and, and they're arguing about who's the strongest. And the lion says, I'm the king of the jungle, I'm stronger than you. And the man says, I'm the king of the world, I'm stronger than you. And they're having this fruitless argument until they stumble upon a picture, still in the jungle, keep working with me, right? And the picture is of a man defeating a lion. And the man says, you see, I told you I'm stronger than you. And the lion says, yes, but who drew that picture? <laughs> what has become important to my work in working with historically marginalized communities at the intersections of language, race, and power in education, is interrogating who authors the dominant narratives and the dominant framings in our societies, in our schools, in our, in our classrooms, in our world. It's important to know that in exploring and doing this research on language, race, and power, I stumbled upon some really interesting contradictions. You see, what I know of myself is that the multiple literacies that I bring to the table, my composite linguistic identity gives me power. But when I enter into institutional spaces, into classroom spaces, that power is not valued and often stripped away. In these spaces that claim to celebrate diversity, that claim to want to celebrate diverse culture, what instead happens is a perpetual invitation to engage in cultural erasure. But I found some contradictions in exploring these questions both contextually and historically, right? So in the social context of now, one of the contradictions I found was with the McDonald's slogan. Who knows the McDonald's slogan? I'm loving it, right? I'm loving it, we know that. What I found in my research is that this slogan is participating in a feature of African-American English called consonant variation. The dropping of the letter G. This very statement, I'm loving it, this very feature, this consonant variation is something that would be corrected within a classroom space if I were to write it on my paper. 
Yet this billion dollar corporation is able to utilize this linguistic practice for mass appeal and to capitalize on this cultural form of expression. I found another example in the show Modern Family. You know, I, I love that show. And there's this episode called She Crazy, which is weird because like, there's not a lot of people of color in the show, right? And so I'm looking at the episode, and throughout the episode, everyone, she crazy, she crazy, she crazy. And I'm like, okay, I do my research. Brilliant scholars have shown us that another feature of African-American English exists there called copula absence, the absence of the verb to be. These features that have been asserted and designated and researched by linguists for years have been established as features of African-American English that directly connect to the West African languages that they are historically rooted in. These language practices are valued in particular spaces, but there's a contradiction with what happens in institutional spaces. Right? And there's a history here. I trouble up this issue because it is resonant with the history that is deeply rooted in racism and colonialism. There's a West African author, his name is um, Gugi Wationgo. I speak of him often. He wrote this book called Decolonizing the Mind. He speaks about his time existing in colonial Kenya. He was there before Kenya was colonized. He said there was a time when the language of the classroom and the language of the community were one, but then came a colonial education. He said Berlin of 1884 was affected through the sword and the bullet. Right? But the, the, the night of the sword and the bullet was followed by the morning of the chalk and the blackboard. He said the bullet was the means of physical subjugation. Language was the means of spiritual subjugation. What would happen is, if you were caught speaking your mother tongue, Gikuyu, in the classroom, in colonial Kenya, you would either be physically beaten or you would have to wear a sign around your neck that said, I am stupid or I am a donkey. It was very important to the colonial subjugation process that the language of the people who were being oppressed was divorced from the community. Those are some of the practices that we reiterate today. When I talk about liberation literacies, the work that I do with educators across our country, it's because that historical and, and, and contextual dissonance that I'm bringing up plays out right now in our world. I work with members of historically marginalized communities. Young black people who say, yes, I engage in black li literacy practices, but in places where I feel safe. A sense of fugitivity exists there that has historical resonance in American chattel slavery. A time when it was illegal for black people in this country to be able to read and write. A lot of that resonates with what's happening today in our classroom and in our world. There are so many ways to engage in racism. There are so many ways to engage in oppression. There are wonderful scholars who say language is a site of cultural struggle, right? And if we think about that, if we think about what it means in our institutional spaces to continue participating in the erasure and the oppression of people from historically marginalized groups instead of incorporating, validating, and celebrating who they are in these institutional spaces, then we do a disservice to ourselves and to our world. So a lot of times when I bring up this conversation, that question of um, standard English as the language of power comes about which is why I brought up the McDonald's example, which is why I brought up the spaces where this power exists. There's a wonderful book called Articulate While Black that speaks about President Obama's ability to navigate multiple languages and literacies and his, that centrality, the centrality of that was essential to the success of his campaign. You see, a lot of times you hear the word minority to refer to people who look like me, but I'm a member of the global majority.
And it means that the languages, the literacies, and the power that comes from the marginalized spaces that people of color navigate have wonderful tools and power to transform our world, to give us access. So when I talk about liberation literacies, really what I'm talking about is a set of principles that emerge out of the work that I do, the research that I've done, and the practice that I engage in. And actually, a lot of what you saw today is framed by these principles that I'm going to share with you in a moment. The idea that the voices of these young people cannot be constrained and limited to that typical five-paragraph essay. The power of what they have to say is so much deeper than that. And to silence them and to continue marginalizing the identities of students in the service of a singular standard is violence. So there are five principles, and I call these paradigm principles. I call them paradigm principles because often when I share these principles, um, educators, administrators, people who work in, in, in educational contexts, it just sounds like more work to do. Like, oh, you're giving us more work to do. We got enough to do, right? But these are paradigm principles. And I say they're paradigm principles because they are principles that are centered on and governed by a paradigm shift. Stephen Covey says that paradigms are maps. Low key, I want Stephen Covey to be my white uncle, like really, like, I love this guy, right? So he said like paradigms are maps. It's the way that we approximate reality. And so what I'm saying is that once we reconstruct and understand that institutional spaces must reimagine themselves to truly understand, integrate, and accept the diversity that exists in our world, we need new paradigms in order to enact that. Actually, right now, many of the predominantly white institutions that exist in our world still have the infrastructure from slavery. There are historical colleges right now that still have the slave quarters built in. If we don't reimagine our institutional spaces beyond just the inclusion of having someone of a different race in the space, then we are not truly integrating anything, right? So, so the first, there are five principles, and the, and the five principles, there are five A's. They're all A's because I'm a poet and I like rhythm, I like, you know, I like alliteration, it's just who I am, right? So there are five A's, and the first A speaks to awareness. The first A says, who am I? If we are thinking about nurturing youth voice, creating space for youth voice in our classrooms in new and in powerful ways that disrupt the historical, racist, colonial perceptions that we've upheld for too long, it has to begin with critical awareness. Who am I as a student? Who am I as an educator in the space, and what does that mean in our world? And it's not just a random awareness, but an awareness of the social identities that we each navigate, including the language practices that we bring to the table. So that I get to say, well, actually, I speak African American English, I speak Caribbean Creolized English. There are multiple ways that I understand and articulate and name the world around me, right? The first A is that awareness thinking about who you are and what your linguistic repertoire consists of. The second A speaks to agency and access. You see, once you understand who you are, once you understand the privileges that are associated with different aspects of who you are, or the way that who you are is marginalized in different ways, once you get a full understanding of what that means in our communities, a lot of young people, I, I work with a lot of young um, people who engage in African-American English practices but have no idea that it has value. Because they've been taught that it's wrong, that it's bad, that it's delinquent, that it's deficient. Once you go through that awareness process and you become aware that my language has power, right? Once you become aware of that, then you say, well, what kind of agency and access exists for me in the world? Because of the way that I speak, because of the tools that I bring to the table with my linguistic repertoire, there are spaces that I can access in the world. There's agency that I can have. That was the argument for, for, for Barack Obama's ability to access and bond with different communities because he could speak in different ways. 
The third A speaks to actualization. This principle, this paradigm principle says, if we do not create continuous opportunities to actualize different ways of knowing and being and expressing in institutional spaces, then we're not doing this work. And that goes directly to the term liberation, right? So the term liberation, when I say liberation literacies, the term liberation in this framework is actually rooted in liberation theology. Liberation theology argues for the interpretation of scripture from the perspective of the oppressed. Understanding that the central figure of scripture was actually someone who was poor and marginalized. And it reimagines the way that we can interpret the world if we understand the power that happens in the margins. And so that liberation piece speaks to the disruption that happens in actualization. Having a TED talk at the center of your English curriculum is disruptive. This disrupts the traditional notions of what it means to read and write in our world, right? What it means to inscribe yourself into the narrative of history beyond the five paragraph essay is that I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna speak from the power of my voice. That's actualization, that's disruptive and that's powerful. The fourth A speaks to achievement because a lot of times when, when I do this work, there are folks who are like, well, you, you know, you, you just want the, you want the kids to be lazy. Actually, it takes a lot more work to be fully invested in who you are, what you have to say, than to perform school for somebody who is imposing a structure on you. Achievement means that we have rigorous, powerful standards, not just for our students, but for our classrooms and our institutions. How are our institutions and our classrooms achieving the aims of true diversity and equity? When we think about achievement, we often think about assessing the students and we never think about assessing the institutions that are meant to serve the students. So achievement is not unidirectional. It says we wanna understand how engaging in this process transforms the student but how engaging in this process transforms the space and transforms the discipline. I work with young people in New York City and we teach them the qualitative research process. They do research, powerful research on their schools and community, but they learn it alongside hip hop literacies. So when they're sharing with you their research data and analysis process, sometimes they spit in bars. It changes the way that we imagine engaging in the exchanging of content. It actually transforms it. When we engage in, 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 in hip hop cultural practices around freestyle, extemporaneous practices, different cognitive abilities come to the fore. There's value in those practices that challenge the discipline. So achievement speaks to that. Achievement speaks to challenging the standards that we hold for ourselves and our institutions and our world. And then the last A speaks to alteration and action. It means that this is a principle that says that we are invested in understanding that our institutions must be adaptable, must be accommodating, and truly inclusive of diverse ways of knowing. So once we understand the way that a different form of literacy, that the linguistic repertoire, the histories, the cultures, the memories of the young people that we work with, once we un understand the way that that challenges this institution, we think about how we reimagine the institutional space. My curriculum can't stay the same. My pedagogical approaches cannot stay the same. This institution might need to reimagine itself. Back to the hip hop example, in hip hop, the cipher that we participate in is a circle. There is no one person standing at the front bearing all knowledge and imposing it on the room. It's a democratic space. So when I teach in my classrooms as a professor, we gotta sit in a circle. We gotta challenge the idea of what teaching and learning looks like because I'm learning from this cultural space that there are different ways of imagining our world. 
say to you this story of my father who taught me how to ride a bike when I was 10 years old in, in Brooklyn. And I had a little pink bike and he, uh, you know, he's just like, all right, jump on it, go for it. I got on the bike and I fell, right? Because I, I didn't know how to ride a bike. So over and over again, he tried to get me, he tried to hold me, it didn't work out. So he said, he said get off the bike. Now, he has a thick Trini accent, so he didn't say like, get off the bike, right, right? He has like a whole accent. So he's like, get off the bike. I get off the bike and he's like, do you have balance? I'm like, I don't know, like, you know, I'm 10, I don't know. He's like, do you have balance? He said, so I want you to stand on one foot. I stood on one foot, he said, a couple of minutes, I'm like, yo, this guy's tripping, like, I don't know what's going on with daddy today, but okay, I'm just on this sidewalk standing on one foot. After a couple of minutes, I found my balance. He said, now get back on the bike. I got back on the bike and I rode straight down the block. What my father taught me in that moment was that if I did not have balance in myself, it would be impossible for me to have balance on the bike. I introduce this framework, this notion of liberation literacies, and a call to action for a paradigm shift that begins with a critical awareness of yourself and your world. Because if we do not have socially just practices in ourselves, here, in the silence, then it is impossible to have social justice in our world. Thank you.